Right, in my last video I started going through the various accessories that I've had fitted to the Bonneville at the time I bought it. I started last time with the cruise control, um, which was quite a long and involved explanation. This week I just want to quickly go over the remaining accessories that are fitted to the bike and I intend to wrap all those up in this one video. Now, first of all, an apology, um, I have a long-term shoulder injury which has flared up in the last week and a half and it's made it almost impossible for me to ride or do any filming. And for that reason, I've had to reuse some footage uh, that you may have seen in other videos. As I say, I apologise for that. Hopefully, by the time it comes to making the next video, I'll be firing on all four cylinders again and I can get back to how things usually are. I've not actually looked at the Triumph accessory pages since I bought my bike six months ago and one thing that I did notice straight away is there have been quite a few price changes. Some items have gone up in price as you would expect, some have remained the same but strangely some have been reduced in price which perhaps demonstrates that Triumph's pricing structure of uh, think of a ridiculous number double it and then add VAT has perhaps backfired on them with some of the items and I certainly know that from some of the reviews that I've watched people have sort of exhibited their disgust at the price of some of Triumph's accessories. So first of all we've got the chrome finished tyre valve caps. They are what they are, they serve a function and they certainly look better than the usual sort of black plastic ones that you can get. They're £10 each, the price hasn't changed since last year. The only reservation I have about them is that obviously they have to have uh, an o-ring of some sort inside them to stop air escaping while the bike's in motion. Uh, something to do with the centrifugal force allowing air to escape through the valve. Now these are just loosely slotted into the end and I, I do check my tyre pressures on a regular basis and they are a pain in the ass. They either stick to the end of the valve when you remove the valve cap or the fall out of the valve cap as you're moving it out of the way to actually check your tyre pressure. At £10, I know it's not a great deal of money, but having said that, there's not a great deal to these actual accessories. And I do think that Triumph should have addressed this little problem at the design stage. It is, after all, a premium product, and I would have expected... Uh, premium performance from something as important as this little accessory. Moving on we have the combine grab rail and rack in chrome. Now I do do a bit of bike camping um, from time to time and I needed some way of carrying luggage around with me. Unfortunately this uh, particular rack is a bit of a disappointment. I've not used it in anger yet and there's one simple reason for that. It looks lovely, it really does look the part on the bike, but it has a maximum carrying capacity of three kilograms. Now that's one and a half bags of sugar that you would pick up from the supermarket. Now in my 35 years riding bikes and purchasing luggage, I've never come across a back rack with such a low carrying capacity. And I think what we have here is a case of Triumph producing an accessory which is focused more on style than actual usability. On the whole, its weight restriction and its relative size don't make this the most practical back rack I've ever seen for a bike. And if you are in the market for something like this, you, you might be as well sort of having a look and seeing what some of the third party producers are, uh, are making. They'll probably be cheaper and uh, probably a damn sight more practical. Now next up we have the brown ribbed comfort seat. At the time I bought this in the main narrative for the accessories section on the Triumph website, this was described as being stitched leather. Also, when I did actually pick it up with the bike, the salesman did confirm to me that it is constructed from real leather, uh, albeit that it has been PU coated for weather resistance. Now, I can't say for certain whether it's leather or it's not leather, but what I will say is that it doesn't look, smell or feel like leather to me. It could be that that coating does alter the properties of the actual leather, but if that's the case, it has altered it drastically. I'll also say that when the bike's left out in sunshine for some period of time and it actually gets quite warm, it does soften up and becomes quite stretchy, which is something you would expect more from a plastic material than a leather material. 
Now that aside, it is still a very nice seat and it is very comfortable. It is fastened together with proper stitches rather than uh, a sort of printed version of stitching that you often see on the plastic seats. And it has a nice embroidered Triumph logo on the back. Now I can literally sit in this seat all day and rad and I don't suffer any discomfort from it whatsoever. It was a little bit firm to start with, but after about 1,000, 1,500 miles, it seems to have broken in quite nicely. And on the whole, I am very pleased with it. I did remove the strap because I just found it got in the way a little bit when you were shifting around on the bike. And I don't particularly like the look of the strap anyway. That's a really simple matter. It's just two bolts underneath and it's off in a matter of seconds. So that brings us on to the aluminium sump plate or sump guard. Again, it is what it is. I got the clear anodized aluminium version because I wanted a bit of a contrast to the black engine. And I'm quite pleased with the choice. It does give the bottom part of the engine a bit of protection from stones and, and general filth being kicked up by the front wheel. And in that way, for me, it does perform its function. Other than that, it's more of a styling choice for me rather than anything else. I don't intend off-roading with a bike and the bike's not designed for it. Now, the price isn't too bad at £100. I've seen aftermarket items that were no better than this for a lot more money. And it does have a, a cutaway for your sump plug, so you shouldn't need to remove it when it comes to doing an oil change. Now, next up, we have the chain guard chrome drilled. And this is where these strange pricing anomalies come in with Triumph. They also do another accessory chain guard, which is the same chain guard as the one that the bike comes with fitted as standard, but instead of powder coated in black, it's chromed, as is this one. But it doesn't have the holes drilled in it. Other than that, they're both identical. Now, you would think that drilling those holes means extra work and time, therefore this would be more expensive than the standard chromed one, but that's not the case. It's actually £30 cheaper, and I can only assume that on the day that the uh, pricing guy was actually working the prices out for these two, for a bit of variety in his life, he decided to price them according to weight. So there's nothing outstanding about this particular chain guard. Um, it does, in my view, look a lot nicer than the powder coated one that the bike comes with. Just one point, and this applies to all Triumph chromed parts. They are all described as being a chrome finish, and there's a legal reason for that. In UK law, in order for an item to be described as chrome plated, it must have been chrome plated to a specific British standard in order to give it maximum corrosion and weather resistance. Now, Triumph's not alone in doing this. I think most bike manufacturers are the same. What they actually do is they skip quite a few steps in that process of chrome plating. So legally, they're not allowed to describe it as chrome plated because it doesn't meet British standards. And it does require some care to stop it turning into a, a rusty mess. That said, I don't think you'll have much trouble with a chain guard with all the oil that gets thrown upon it from the chain. So moving along, we have the Triumph LED indicators. Now these come as pairs for front and rear. They come in different sizes. I won't go into that because there isn't time. It's up to you to make the choices for your setup of bike. Now I have to say that I really love these. These are my all time favorites among all the accessories that I've got on the bike. Obviously they have a very modern look, but somehow with quite a retro feel. And I feel that they give the bike a sort of a, a dare I say, steampunk look, which I quite like. They're mainly made of a black shiny plastic with a brushed aluminium bezel at near where the indicator lens is. And to be honest, I just can't fault them in any way. Now, I paid £120 for them. There has been a price increase, and for a set of four of these, you're now looking at £140. Right, quickly moving on. Next, we've got the auxiliary power socket. Very reasonable price at £25. It's a standard Heller-type DIN socket. And really, this is an essential piece of kit nowadays, especially if you use the Optimate type 
battery chargers which I think are an essential item nowadays for these modern CAN bus and LIN bus uh, bike electrical systems. It works flawlessly, I've had no problems with it. My only reservation is that the mounting point is right behind the bike cylinders. It does get very hot there and there is a danger of melting power cables when you uh, plug them into it when the bike's just been running and the engine's hot. Right, last but not least, we come to the waxed cotton panniers in olive. Now, I do understand that I am in danger of being that guy on YouTube that does nothing but bash Triumph. But if I'm to do a review and a product isn't right, I do think it's my obligation to let you know about it. And these panniers are one of those products. Now, not everybody likes the look of these. I know some people hate them. Personally, I love the look of them. I think they fit exactly with the look of the bike, but unfortunately that's where my love for them ends. Now, the first thing that pissed me off about these is putting aside the fact that I ordered two olive ones and the dealership ordered an olive one and a back one. Also skimming over the fact that when they finally replaced the black one just before I picked the bike up with an olive one it wasn't the same olive color as the original one so that I don't actually have a matching pair. The salesman held his hand out just as I was about to ride home and said that for another £50 I could have a waterproof cover to protect the panniers. He then went on to explain that during my 100 mile journey home if it should rain, by the time I got to my destination, the panniers would likely be ruined because they're not waterproof. Now, this pearl of wisdom from him was about as welcome as a fart in a space suit. Triumph is becoming quite famous for these dirty tricks where you buy an accessory, you think you've got everything you need, and then when it comes to fit it, you find you have to go and shell out a load more money to finish the job off and the bar end mirrors are one example that springs to mind. Now out of principle, I refused to buy the waterproof covers. Instead, in disgust, I took the panniers off the bike and threw them in the boot of the car that had given me a lift to the dealership. For £450, which is what I think I paid for these, these should come with a waterproof cover if they require it. Triumph has no business taking that amount of money off you and then make you pay another £50 just so that you can use it. And that's not where the problems end with these panniers. Although they do appear to have been very well crafted, um, the actual materials used don't seem to be that fantastic to be quite honest. And all things considered, the general design of these panniers is abysmal. To attach the pannier you slide it over a hoop which resembles sort of like half of a coat hanger. You then have to attach it to a reinforced leather strap which is bolted onto the seat rail of the bike. And you do this with two side press plastic buckles. Now to fasten them up you've got to take the seat off the bike which is a major inconvenience. And even then it's the devil's own job trying to get everything to meet up correctly so you can actually get them fastened. But the good news for any opportunist thief that takes a fancy to your bags and what's contained within them is that he has no such trouble actually getting them off. And he can actually unfasten those clasps in a matter of seconds without removing the seat and be aware with your luggage before you know it. I'm not sure what the actual carcass of the these bags are actually made up of. I'm presuming it's some sort of stiff plastic sheeting which is sandwiched between what is a very thin wax cotton on the outside and some sort of nylon fabric liner on the inside. Now although the carcass is quite stiff when you first get these bags, within a few days of use it does slacken up considerably and this is where the problems start. At each end of the panniers there's a sort of a, a tongue or flap that comes over which is attached to the top flap of the bag. This has a press stud to secure that flap to the carcass of the bag, presumably in an attempt to keep out water. Now the problem is that this press stud is quite stiff and in actual fact to order, in order to 
get that press stud to fasten up you need to put your hand inside the bag to support the carcass while you try to press that stud into place obviously the major problem here being that you can't do that when the bag's closed but you need to have the bag closed in order to fasten the press stud up you soon get into the habit of just forgetting about them and leave them flapping in the wind the second problem is that when you open the bag fully to put anything in or taking anything out this tongue or flap has a habit of slipping inside the bag so when you try to close it you find you can't get it closed because that tongue is stopping it from closing now the two straps that hold the main flap down have to be inserted through the flap and then pulled down over a twist clasp which to say the least this whole operation when fastening it or unfastening it is a major hassle that could have come up with an easier idea than that both bags also have two pockets on the front but again you've got this problem with a press stud which is too stiff and it's the devil's own job once again to get this fastened up when you actually put anything inside it at least when you're using these the bag is open so that you can actually get your hand behind it in order to fasten the press stud up but again it's just one major inconvenience for a bag which at the end of the day should be very easy to use each bag only has a capacity of 13.8 litres now that's not an awful lot in fact it's not much at all but that's by the by really it doesn't matter how much space you've got because once again when you look at the label on the inside of these bags they only have a three kilogram maximum payload now to sum these bags up really they're about as much use as a chocolate fire guard and it's easy to see why so many of them quickly end up on ebay looking in a very disheveled state as the owner desperately tries to get rid of them in order to get some decent luggage for his bike right i'm sorry this video has gone on so long but i did need to get these things out of the way because i've got a lot of other things coming up in the pipeline over the next few weeks i hope you found it interesting and informative and i'll see you next time